Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Day three of the 20th Party Congress has been quite slow, so we will spend today's episode focusing more on economic-related developments. We note that it's a very sensitive week for the country. Indeed, traveling between provinces to do on-the-ground work and analysis this week has been the most difficult in my many years in the country. Let's start today's episode though with the housing crisis. In a blow to local governments and a sign of just how bad the housing crisis is becoming in terms of its pressure on local government fiscal conditions. This week, the Ministry of Finance in Beijing expressed its prohibition. For the purchase of land use rights by state-owned enterprises, the practice of local state actors buying land, well, specifically land use rights, has exploded this year as the housing crisis destroyed private sector demand for land to build apartments on. Land sales contributed 8.7 trillion RMB to the coffers of local authorities across China last year, representing approximately 42% of their revenue. However, as we saw this year, in the first nine months of 2022, these numbers plunged over 60 percent. Because land sales are such a critical source of extra budgetary revenue for local governments, the drop in land sales smashed fiscal conditions, and many local governments directed state-backed actors like state-owned enterprises and local government financing vehicles to fill that hole left by developers. This was always unsustainable and will certainly be slowing down now. However, the Ministry of Finance, in a stern warning, described the practice as a sham, expressing earlier this week, "Quote: Local governments should not increase land revenue in a sham way, on the backs of government-backed companies to remedy local coffers." End quote. It's clear who the Ministry of Finance is targeting with this as well. Quote, "This is targeting those state-owned companies and local government financing vehicles purchasing land more actively than before to support the land market. The problem is these transactions will create hidden debts for local governments, and this is something that the central government does not want to see. Things are likely to be opaque if local government sells land to its other local government financing vehicles or SOEs. It is like transferring from one's left pocket to the right pocket. The financing vehicles can borrow from local banks for land purchase, and local governments may be liable for them indirectly through implicit guarantees. It means local governments are effectively borrowing more, and this will put more pressure on the country's fiscal system in a hidden manner. End quote. Other commentators argue that while this Ministry of Finance move to prohibit this practice is the right one, it still doesn't address the original problem. Quote, Allowing local governments to reverse the decline in land sale revenues by setting up special purpose vehicles to buy land from themselves was simply a way for them to borrow money and pretend the proceeds were actually land sales revenues. This was extremely risky because, among other things, it meant that local governments were effectively doubling down on their already excessive exposure to the real estate market. The Ministry of Finance was absolutely right to clamp down on this practice, but local governments are desperate. Their revenues have dropped sharply, even as their expense has risen. What is more, they are expected to fund a wave of growth next year. The Ministry of Finance stopped them from faking revenues without addressing the reasons they had to do so. Beijing must know how difficult the circumstances are that local governments face, and yet isn't doing much to help. I think we are probably seeing the beginning of what, over the next few years, will be a very contentious relationship between local governments. And Beijing. End quote. Meanwhile, and staying on our theme of the housing crisis, this week Chinese junk dollar bonds have dropped to a record low, according to a Bloomberg index. The junk dollar notes, dominated by real estate firms, fell 0.3 cents on the dollar to 55.7 cents on Monday this week, below the previous low of 56 cents on the dollar in August. The post-August rally, sparked by government statements of support, has thus faded. Bloomberg writes that investors have been on the lookout for further policy steps after builders stalled many projects amid a persistent slump in housing sales. But recent developments have shown that even efforts the market had initially cheered are not by themselves enough to soften the pain. The outlet gives the example of Shanghai-based CIFI Holdings Group. 
which defaulted earlier this month when it failed to pay a coupon on a Hong Kong dollar convertible bond. That was particularly worrying because, quote, the firm was considered a barometer for the broader success of a new rescue effort by Beijing that emerged in August to use state guarantees to help a select group of developers access domestic funding, end quote. Share prices of Chinese developers are also suffering. A Bloomberg intelligence gauge of the sector reached its lowest point since January 2012, last week. Sorry about that. Anyway, let's move on now to our economic developments. If you guys are enjoying today's episode of China Update, don't forget to the like button. And as always, anyone who wants to go that extra mile and help me continue making these episodes, Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. This is a tremendous help for anyone who's willing to go that extra mile. As always, thank you so much, everybody for the ongoing support. Okay, next up, let's move through several important economic developments. Generally, the powerful China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission has announced that it will allow foreign multinational groups to directly establish internet finance companies from next month in a move intended to widen market access for global capitalists. According to updated rules published by the regulator, multinational groups incorporated outside the Chinese mainland will be able to directly set up internal finance companies on the mainland, starting from next month. Under the old rules passed in 2006, foreign investors first needed to establish a wholly owned subsidiary on the mainland and then set up an internet finance company. Due to the awkwardness and uncertainty of the older requirements, only a small handful of international firms ended up establishing internet finance companies in China. These included Germany's Siemens and Japan's Panasonic. It is hoped that the new rules will increase this number and increase competition in the growing industry. Next up, troubled mega conglomerate Fosun or Fuxing in Mandarin, which we have been following for about a month now, is planning to direct its subsidiary, Fosun International Limited, to sell its stake in a Chinese steelmaker to a private metals giant for around 15 billion RMB, or 2.1 billion US dollars. Chinese financial media outlet Yizhai, which broke the story yesterday, writes that Fosun International Limited will transfer its 60% shareholding in Nanjing Iron and Steel United Co. Another Chinese financial media outlet, Tsai Sin, also writes this week, quote, Fosun has cut holdings in at least eight listed companies this year and will have cashed out nearly 40 billion yuan. The conglomerate has come under mounting pressure from its huge debt pile as its liquidity was hit by the declining property market and weak retail consumption. End quote. Fosun operates a wide variety of businesses which range from real estate development and tourism to pharmaceuticals and consumer products. By the end of June, its short term borrowings had ballooned 29% year on year to 123 billion RMB, surpassing the firm's cash and cash equivalents. Net profit attributable to shareholders fell 32.8% year-on-year in the first half of 2022. And finally for today, let's step back and look at the wider economy as a whole. And BlackRock Investment Institute has published a note this week arguing that the era of fast Chinese growth has come to an end. Quote, the Chinese economy grew apace in the 10 years prior to the pandemic by 7.7% on average each year, but it now faces a set of acute challenges that, in our view, mean it's entering a stage of significantly slower growth. The big focus on COVID-related ups and downs in activity ignores another underlying issue that, we think, will significantly challenge Chinese growth next year and beyond. End quote. BlackRock also, controversially perhaps, believes that exports will shrink by 6% a year over 2022 and 2023, which, combined with US rate hikes, quote, would ultimately warrant a depreciation of the RMB of twice that seen this year, end quote. The research note argues that a best-case scenario for China would be a new normal of a 3% growth rate. 
The leading cause for this structural decline is not due to zero COVID or property either, it argues, but demographics. Quote, COVID controls are reducing potential output today. While they might be eased, we still think the potential growth rate of the Chinese economy might have fallen below 5% and could fall further to around 3% by the turn of the decade. Why? Most importantly, the working age population, having grown rapidly, is now shrinking. Fewer workers mean the economy cannot produce as much without generating inflation unless productivity growth accelerates. But we think international trade and tech restrictions, as well as tighter regulations on companies operating in China, will dampen productivity growth. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I will see you all tomorrow.